All right, today's lecture is primarily going to be looking at chapter uh, 22 in your book, which is the chapter dealing with uh, war and with uh, conquest of, uh, of Southern Africa. Now, you also should take a look at chapters 23 and 24. They are relevant in terms of putting what's going on in South Africa in the context of uh, the overall uh, continent of Africa. But 22 really is the crucial chapter that sets us up for uh, native life in South Africa. Now, the thing that's, that really was kind of said that was unspoken when we talked about um, hot and tight Venus is that South Africa, prior to 1868, was most valuable because of its strategic location, not because of anything that was actually produced in South Africa. Um, you know, if you, I haven't really talked about this in class, but, you know, you all have read the book. I mean, if you look at what was talked about in Hot and Tight Venus, uh, you know, think about it. You know, uh, most of the Afrikaners were farmers. They raised cattle. Uh, they raised sheep. They were farmers. They grew wheat. Uh, they also had vineyards. Uh, you know, cattle, sheep, wine. Nobody has to go all the way to South Africa for that. And if you remember, these uh, things were actually most valuable uh, for Cape Town as a uh, port city, because when people went through Cape Town, when people stopped at Cape Town, they were on their way to Asia. You know, uh, Cape Town, you know, if you look on a map, you know, if you leave Europe, you, you go south until you get to Cape Town. And then uh, you stop there, then you turn to the east, and th that'll take you to Asia, first to India, then to East Asia. And so Cape Town was, was a really important stop uh, for people getting supplies of food, getting supplies of fresh water, uh, getting fresh fruit, for instance, because, you know, scurvy, a disease where bones soften or, you know, rickets, that kind of thing, well, you know, which is a bone softening disease. These kind of diseases came about due to people having a, a lack of vitamins. And so Cape Town was really important for that. And so the thing to understand is that South Africa was most important uh, economically uh, in terms of its economic production for agricultural goods. And as I said before, you know, South Africa was a very long ways from Europe. And uh, none of the agricultural goods produced in South Africa uh, were competitive with European production that was right there. And so South Africa was most important because of a strategic location. Whoever controlled South Africa controlled sea lanes that went from Europe uh, to Asia. And so that's why the, the Dutch had it first, then the British got it, and then the British held on to it from that point forward because, uh, you know, from the 18th century until the 19th century, you know, until after World War II, the British had the biggest navy in the world. And so it made sense from the British standpoint that they control as many strategic sea lanes as possible. And uh, that's why they held on to it. Now, as uh, white colonialists, uh, colonization increased in South Africa, what we see is that, you know, agricultural production increased in, in different areas. Uh, you know, like, for instance, I mentioned the Great Trek. I mentioned the uh, Boers moving into Natal, into Zululand. Uh, you know, if you all read, uh, the pre the pre read the chapter related to the previous lecture, uh, you saw about that. Now, when, when the Afrikaners got there, they continued to raise cattle. Uh, British uh, settlers would eventually come into the area. Now, they would start uh, citrus uh, uh, plantations. They would grow oranges and that sort of thing. Um, and also you have British settlers coming into the Eastern Cape and they were primarily sheep herders. And so you see this kind of agricultural production increasing during this time. And as I said before, none of this stuff was particularly competitive uh, with the British market. However, that changes in the very late 1860s. Uh, because what we see is in 1868, in 1868, 
Um, in the town of uh, Kimberley, diamonds were discovered in South Africa. Now, the interesting thing about diamonds is that diamonds are really, really common in Africa because geographically, Africa is a very old continent. Uh, when I say old continent, I mean it's a place where you've had very little plate tectonic activity, you know, like earthquakes and volcanoes and that kind of stuff, you know, for, for many millions of years. And so, therefore, you have a lot of really old deposits, old land masses. And as old land masses wear out, minerals like diamonds and other minerals come close to the surface. And so geographically, that's one of the reasons why Africa is a continent uh, where you see a lot of relative, a lot of pretty easily accessed mineral resources. And so diamonds were discovered in Kimberley. Now this is uh, in, in the area nowadays known as the Northern Cape uh, of uh, South Africa. It's kind of in the north central part of modern day South Africa. And, and diamonds were discovered there. Now, diamonds are really actually quite common, but one of the things that happens in South Africa is that a company named De Beers, now the guy who actually founded the company was uh, uh, named Cecil Rhodes, an Englishman. De Beers was the name of the Africana farmer who actually owned the land that he initially got his property from, that he initially got control of. So he named the company after the farmer who, whose land it was initially on. But what we see is that the beers over time pretty much gets a monopoly over diamond production in South Africa. And because of that, they are able to artificially inflate the price of diamonds. And, you know, they really push certain ideas. Like, for instance, you know, the whole notion that, you know, when a man marries a woman, he should buy her diamond ring. I mean, you know, buying a woman a ring for getting married it was a common thing, but the idea that it always had to be a diamond was not something that you see all throughout history. That was very much something that the, the, the Beers company pushed. And so that's why diamond prices eventually get to be very high because, you know, really, if it, you know, generally speaking with, with uh, gemstones, they're, they're valuable because they're not common. And diamonds are actually super common all over the world. But like I said, that's getting a little bit off, off the story. But let's get on back. Like I said, diamonds were discovered in 1868. And as your book mentions, the area around Kimberley, you know, Kimberley didn't exist at that time, but the area that would become Kimberley uh, was an area actually outside of the Cape Colony. It was north of the Cape Colony, and it was north of the, because the British basically controlled the Cape Town area, and they also controlled the area of the Eastern Cape, and they also had gone east into uh, Natal. But the, north, but, but the northern interior of what would become the Republic of South Africa uh, was still controlled by indigenous African populations, and also controlled by various uh, African-speaking African uh, white populations that had migrated uh, from the Cape Colony. And so once the British realized that there were diamonds in this area, you know, as the book mentions, they were able to uh, get one of the local uh, Africans, uh, a fellow by the name of Vitbor, who was a Griqua. Now, the Griqua, these are people, mixed-race people, people... Uh, you know, the kind of folks that, you know, in, in, in Hot and Tight Venus, when they talked about uh, Sarah Bartman's uh, ancestors escaping the farm and going up north, these were the people who came, uh, became members of groups like the Greek world or the Korana or the Bastas. You know, though, these were various mixed race groups uh, who uh, retained uh, the ability to ride horses that they learned from whites. And, you know, they were able to access guns. And so they were able to kind of take uh, Western techniques and move them deeper into the frontier than where actual whites were. And most of these uh, folks also had connections with missionaries. I mean, the missionary connections were what a lot, were what gave them protection, uh, you know, kept uh, Africanists from overrunning them and, you know, basically trying to force them back into slavery and also allowed them to get access to Western supplies like guns. But as I said before, the British were able to talk to Vitbor and, and uh, and told him that he needed protection, you know, basically to protect him against the Africanists, that they would come in and, you know, claim uh, that they controlled the area. And so the British were able to negotiate and get control of the area. And so this meant that the British got control of what became the town of Kimberley. And very quickly, Kimberley grew to a city of about 30,000 people. You know, a pretty big city in a, in a frontier area like South Africa. 
Now, one of the things that's really important to understand is that urbanization in South Africa really created a lot, a lot of opportunities for indigenous people. Because as I said before, uh, you know, most of the people in South Africa, most of the older populations in South Africa, made a living off of agriculture one way or the other. Uh, you had African farmers who were cattle, who, who, who raised cattle. Uh, they uh, grew crops. You know, once you had a city there and once you had miners, once you had city people, all of a sudden this became a, a really big market uh, for uh, their agricultural produce. And this is something that you also see in eastern South Africa, too. Uh, and this is very significant because basically what we see is that Africans were very quick to adapt to capitalism. You know, once they realized, you know, how the money economy worked and once they realized that there was a market for their produce, they very quickly began to sell stuff uh, to people in town. Now, this is significant because you had white farmers too, you know, primarily Dutch-speaking or Afrikaans, you know, well, they really didn't use the term Afrikaans in 1868, but these were Dutch-speaking people. They were farmers too. So you had a situation where you had black farmers and white farmers in direct competition with one another. Also, because you had mining going on, you had some black farmers or some blacks who went to the city uh, to get, to, to, to take a claim to, 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 to mine. And one thing I want you all to do, I want you all to go online and I want you to Google pictures of Kimberley, South Africa, because when you Google pictures of Kimberley, South Africa, one of the things you're going to see is right outside of the city, there's this incredibly big hole. I mean, really, you have to see it to understand how big the hole is. And that hole was the area where diamonds were originally found in Kimberley. And so 152 years ago, all of a sudden, you had thousands of men showing up and digging in this big hole trying to find diamonds. And, you know, blacks came there, whites came there. Now, over time, uh, black, cl black claims were forced out. They, they, they were no longer allowed to have their claims there. But still, this meant that, you know, people could come there and, you know, those who weren't farmers, they could come there and work for a certain amount of time, get money, go back home and bring cash to their communities. And so this really changed Africans' uh, lifestyles because this meant that with money, these young men could go home and they could buy cattle. And in these traditional societies, when young men wanted to get married, they had to have a dowry. In other words, in a dowry, you know, D-O-W-R-Y, uh, this is an amount of money that... Uh, a man would pay the family of the bride in order to be given the permission to marry. He, now, you know, in the West, people interpret that he's buying the bride. It's really not, he's really not buying her. But it's an acknowledgement that, you know, having a healthy young wife, you know, this, this was a valuable thing to have, a valuable pr person to add to your household. That's a better way to put it, say person as opposed to thing, excuse me. A valuable person to add to your household. And that... Uh, in recognizing this, uh, they, the, the young man would give the family of the bride a certain amount of money. And so by having access to the, to, to, the, to the money economy, this meant that these young men, instead of working on a farm forever and hoping to get you know enough cows in order to marry, they could go away for six months. They could buy cows, come back home, they'd have money to buy cows, and they could get married. The other really significant thing, too, is that these young men they could go buy guns. They could get a job and they could uh, buy guns. They could buy gunpowder. And so this means that with the development of the, um, uh, uh, of, of the diamond industry, this meant that now you had a proliferation of guns in black communities. I mean, prior to this, you had a few communities like the Sutu and the King Meshweshwe that I mentioned in the last lecture who had managed to get access to guns. And of course, the, the mixed race people, the Greek world or the Quran or other people like that, they had guns. But once you begin to have uh, this influx of labor into the cities, once you begin to have farmers selling goods in the cities, 
then all of a sudden, you know, people have guns. Now, this is very significant because this means that it becomes a whole lot harder uh, for Europeans just to roll up in the communities and take over. Instead of finding guys with spears uh, who fought in infantry formation against people on horses uh, with guns, now all of a sudden, now Africans still didn't have much in the way of horses. They, got, they began to get horses, but not a whole lot just yet. Uh, they found people with guns. And, you know, more importantly, people who greatly outnumbered them with guns. And so, as the book mentions, you know, when the British begin to try to expand and take over this territory in the 1870s and 1880s, uh, the resistance that they run into, and also not just the British, but also the Afrikaners, the resistance they run into from armed Africans is, is intense enough that it, that it ultimately means that they can't quite take over at this point in time. Uh, now, what we see, however, is that, like I said, in 1868 and in the 1870s, uh, you see the British wanting to take over, but basically by the end of the eight, by the end of the 1880s, you know, by the mid 1880s, they they realize that you know they're just not in a position to quite do it yet, and so they kind of back off. Now, interestingly enough, the African group that's probably most famous for fighting the British at this time, the Zulu. Uh, probably were the least effective, you know, even though they had a very famous victory. They had a very famous victory of the Sandawana in 1879. But of all of the Africans, the Zulus probably least were, they were probably the, were the least effective in incorporating guns. Because if you remember from the last lecture, remember I mentioned how under Dengishwayo and then uh, Shaka, uh, the the African the the, the uh, Nguni speaking Africans eventually who became consolidated as the Zulu. Uh, developed a regimental system of fighting using short uh, spears, much the way the Romans or Greek used short swords, in order to become an effective, uh, in, you know, infantry fighting force. Uh, the tendency to hold on to that type of fighting, you know, stayed with the Zulu. Now, in the case of the Battle of the Sandawana in 1879, it worked out for them because the British were uh, encamped on the side of the hill. It was a very foggy day; they couldn't see where to shoot. The Zulu climbed up the hill uh, very quietly until they got close enough to the British that their spears were effective, and they wiped out a British regiment. And, you know, this was the single worst defeat that the British had between the Napoleonic Wars and World War I. <clears throat> but later on, the, the Zulu weren't able to follow up on this because the unique circumstances that made a Sandawana an effective victory uh, didn't work. Now, as the book mentions, you know, for instance, in the case of the Petty uh, fighting the Afrikaners, <coughs> they were much more effective because they had the guns and, you know, they were, in, they were able to push the, 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 the uh, Afrikaners back because they dealt with them with the same kind of weaponry that the Afrikaners had. And so... Industrialization in South Africa was interesting. It, it, it increased the white population. It increased the economy. And for a while, at least, it looked like it was going to increase opportunities for black South Africans. And one of the things that I really want you to take from this is that black South Africans were, you know, were, were perfectly prepared uh, to engage in uh, the market economy. This was not something that they didn't understand. It wasn't something that they weren't prepared to deal with. They were quite capable of dealing with the market economy. But it was a decision on the part of the colonial authorities to force Africans in the position of only being laborers. And we see this in the diamond mine areas where eventually <coughs> Africans are forced to sign contracts where they have to work for six months and they have to live in dormitories, you know, where they're not, where their families aren't around. And their movement is very much restricted. And this system of controlling black labor uh, that starts, you know, in the diamond mines in Kimberley uh, continues into the 20th century and, and really becomes much more strict uh, as, a part, as the apartheid system is brought into South Africa uh, in the 1940s. But I, I think it's really important to understand that apartheid did not create it. Almost all of the methods used to control black labor were actually created by the British 
uh, as they expanded, as they expanded the economy. You know, later on, you know, we get the image of evil Afrikaners and, and apartheid, and the Afrikaners did create apartheid. But the British created the system of segregation in South Africa. The British were the people who really systematized segregation in the 19th and 20th centuries. And so if you really want to get an accurate understanding of how South African history works, uh, you know, you have to look at the role of the British. Now, this is really interesting because, you know, if you go back to the Hot and Time Venus book, of course, it was the British who are ending slavery. It's the British who are pushing to have more equality. And so you might ask, what happens? Well, uh, you can actually go back in your Shillington book and you can look at the sections on uh, colonization that I didn't talk about. And what you see is that in the 19th century, uh, there are some fundamental shifts in attitudes on race. And, you know, the Hot and Top Venus book talks about this a bit, too, about how you have scientific notions of race that develop. And, you know, the notions of inferior and superior people uh, develop. And so by the time you get to the point where the South African economy is really developing, uh, you really have a hardening of the notion of of race and the idea that you have inferior and superior races. And so the idea of Africans being equal or being able to uh, compete economically on the same, on, on an equal footing with, with whites, uh, by that time is just unacceptable. And what we eventually see is that the British, you know, even though they don't necessarily get along with the Afrikaners, they eventually push the Afrikaners into the position of being the junior whites. And the two white communities control African communities in South Africa. Now, in chapter 22, it also goes into detail talking about how uh, the British go into uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, they go into Botswana. They talk about how the Germans go into Namibia. The Portuguese go into uh, Mozambique. And so, therefore, all of Southern Africa becomes colonized. Now, as for South Africa itself, the the, huge, the really huge change is in 1886 when gold is discovered in the Witwatersrand. Now, that's W-I-T-W-A-T-R-S-R-A-N-D, Witwatersrand, which translates in, from, into English as the Whitewater Ridge. Uh, is this, gold is discovered in this area in 1886. Now, this is very significant because the gold is actually uh, much more valuable than, than the diamonds. And also, there's gold in South Africa in very large numbers. However, the thing to understand is that although there's a lot of gold in South Africa, the quality of the gold deposits is not all that great. It's not, you know, it's not like you could just uh, take a shovel and a pipe, uh, a pick, and, you know, hit rocks and all of a sudden you would get great big nuggets of gold. What we see is that there's a lot of gold in there, but... This is gold that's deep underground, and it's buried deep in, the, in, in veins in, in the rocks. So this means that uh, a lot of high technology, chemical processing, mechanical processing, uh, has to go into pulling these rocks from deep underground to the surface, and then they have to be processed in order to get the gold out. And so this means that in uh, South Africa, the gold can only be processed by people who have access to modern technology and who have access to enough money uh, to get this gold out of the ore. And so this means that gold, whereas you had a period where anybody could go into Kimberley and, and get lucky and find diamonds, in uh, the Witzwatersrand, which is further north in the modern-day province of Hautang in, in South Africa, you know, where, where modern-day Johannesburg and Pretoria are. In this area... Uh, the only people who could be viable miners were people who had the capital resources to invest in the machinery and to hire the people who were capable of mining. And so what we see is that from the 1880s onwards, you have a, a significant number of Europeans, people coming from Canada, people coming from the United States, uh, people coming from Australia, people coming from Germany, uh, all, you know, uh, whites from all over the world coming to South Africa. Uh, who have the skills and who have the money uh, in order to become a major miners. Now, <clears throat> it just so happens that this part uh, of South Africa, the, the Hauteng area, 
uh, you know, what, what we nowadays refer to as Hauteng. But at that time, um, this was this was known as uh, the Transvaal er- area uh, uh, of South Africa, you know, the area ac- across the Vaal River. Uh, this area had been the part of South Africa that the British had allowed the Afrikaners to have. And so this meant that the discovery of gold meant that the Afrikaner uh, Republic of Transvaal and to a lesser degree the Orange Free State became a lot more well to do because of the gold because of the gold and the fact that they were able to tax the British companies and you know like Anglo American a number of these big companies uh, the Afrikaners were able to invest in their army they had a much better equipped army <coughs> uh, the farmers were able to uh, Af- Afrikaner farmers were able to uh, make money or boar farmers, which would be the more accurate term, uh, were able to make money uh, selling food to all of these people who moved into town. So uh, even though the Afrikaners did not control the mines, the British controlled the mines, uh, they still made a lot of money off of the mines. And so this put them in a much stronger position. Now, in 1895, uh, Cecil Rhodes, who's the guy who owned... um, De Beers, and who also by this time became a, a colonial official in South Africa, tried to uh, uh, organize a, a, a revolt among uh, British uh, people in, in, in the Transvaal, uh, led by Dr. Jameson in 1895, known as the Jameson Raid. Uh, this was a really embarrassing failure. And uh, it looked like at the time that this really kind of put the nail in the coffin for the idea of the British taking over. Uh, but what we see is that uh, the, the the leaders of the Afrikaners, in particular, uh, President uh, President uh, Pretorius, uh, he actually uh, publicly uh, accepted a, 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 a telegram uh, from the Germans because at this time the Germans remember they are colonizing the next door territory of Namibia. Yeah, he accepted a telegram and from, from the Germans that congratulated him on kicking the British out. Politically, the British made a big deal about this, saying, you know, look, you got to watch those Afrikaners. After all, they are Dutch, you know, you know which means they're kind of halfway German already. And we better watch them because they might try to undermine us in the future. And what we eventually see is that a, a, a war, uh, uh, you know, what's known as the Second South African War, because the first ones, you know, were back in the 1880s when they when the British tried to take over. But in 1899, we have the Second South African War, which breaks out from 1899 to 1902. And this is a really crucial war because this is when the British defeat the Afrikaners and would eventually lay the foundation for what became the Union of South Africa. Now, as I said before, when the Second War comes up, the Afrikaners, they had invested in their military. And so they were actually well-trained enough and well-equipped that when the British initially come, they're able to defeat the British. However, the British Empire is much larger than the African, than the African republics. And so after an initial defeat, the British, as the book mentioned, sent in half a million soldiers. Now, one of the things, and they are, able to eventually defeat the Afrikaners in a conventional war. Now, one of the really interesting things about the South African War is that the British, unlike in past conflicts, would not accept African allies. They would not accept African troops. Now, there were some rare exceptions to this that are going to be discussed in native life in South Africa. But by and large, uh, the British made it a point to say that this is a white man's war and they would not accept Africans you know, participating in the war. And really, this was a direct reflection of, of the notion that had been developing in, in, you know, from the mid-19th century onward uh, that African colonialism, uh, one of the foundations of it, even though it was never explicitly stated, is the idea of white supremacy. And so, therefore, Africans were not allowed to fight. They, they, they could, they could uh, be workers, they could uh, serve white troops, but they would not be allowed to have guns and fight like white men. And this is very significant because the Africans, and this is something you're going to, when you look in native life in South Africa, uh, 
you know, this is something that the author mentions time again, that, you know, Africans were, were perfectly willing to fight against the Africanus because they knew the Africanus, uh, you know, were, were quite hostile to African independence. But the British would not accept them because they wanted subservient blacks too. And so the, the South African War ends up being, a, 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 although it's a three-year war, it's a pretty nasty war because, like I said, initially the Africanus have military success, then the British bring in larger troops, and then they defeat the Africanus. But the Africanus then begin to fight a guerrilla war. You know, it's the kind of situation where in the daytime, uh, you know, the Africana would be on the farm. You know, you go by and, and you know, you'd see, um, you know, the Africana farmer there. The British would go by and see the Africana farmer. But at nighttime, uh, the Africana is organized into what they refer to as the commandos, you know, where they got in small units of horsemen. And they would attack British troops and really inflict some pretty nasty damage on them. So, you know, once the Africanus could not win a conventional war, they began to fight a guerrilla war. The British respond to this, however, with a new invention. The British invent the concentration camp. The British say, you know, look, if we can't beat you all in a conventional warfare, we're going to round up all of the women and children and people, and you know, all the men, women and children, and, and put them into camps where you can't get out and fight us. Now, this process of putting uh, Africanus into camps really becomes a, a, a source of bitterness between the English-speaking and Africanus-speaking community for a very long time. As a matter of fact, it's something that I'm not sure some people haven't still let go of yet because a lot of Africanus died. People got tuberculosis. People uh, uh, starved. It was, it was a pretty brutal situation. But it was effective in breaking Africana resistance. So by 1902, the war was over. Now, what happens is that once the war is over, they begin to start the process of negotiation. Now, once again, Africans find out that they're going to be left on the outside. And that one of the foundations of negotiation is that South Africa would be controlled by white people, by white men. Of course, because women weren't voting yet. And so this means that by 1910, you have the Union of South Africa. And it's pretty clear that there would be no expansion of black voting rights. Now, blacks still could vote in the Western Cape. That was a right that blacks had gotten there back in the 1830s. You know, those black, or, or actually the Cape Colony period, because like when we look in the book on, on Alfred Coma, we'll see that. Uh, when he was a young man, his family could vote because they uh, met the qualifications to vote. Uh, the black vote in the Cape Colony remained, but there would be no expansion of the franchise in the Transvaal or the Orange Free State or Natal, any of those places. And so that's one of the things that you really see coming up in native life of, in South Africa is that uh, it becomes obvious that there would be no uh, chance for uh, black political equality. Well, anyway, class, uh, like I said, this primarily deals with chapter 22. You can look at chapters 23 and 24 and start reading Native Life in South Africa. Try to get through about the first three or four chapters. It's a pretty long book. Uh, a lot of times he kind of makes the same argument over and over again. But it's really one of the real important books in the political history of South Africa. And uh, the next lecture will be dealing with that book. Well, anyway, that's it on this lecture. Uh, have a good week, and uh, you got a lot of reading to do. Take care.